why is training so complicated now and what are the effects of that and i would say the overcomplication of the process of training for which i'm partly responsible because there was no science in training when i started all this so i gave the first lectures for doc trainers on learning theory but i had already converted it to i took it from learning theory texts of course but I converted it from stuff that was laboratory generated and would not work in practice, like all of the punishment. <laughs> yeah, it's true what happened in the laboratory and the little rats learned avoidance training, you know, aversive training and all that stuff. Um, but that won't work in real life. Why? Because we are not computers training rats. You know, number one, dogs uh, don't want to be ratist, but a dog is a little more complicated animal. But we are not computers for better and for worse. For worse, can't compute. Most trainers can't compute. So forget even talking about the variable schedules, the variable reinforcement schedule, because you can't compute one. Okay, I'll, I'll try and compute the VR5 as I'm talking to you. I've got to get my brain really in gear. Okay, here we go. Uh, uh, five, two, nine, eight, four, uh, three, seven, six, two, five, one. Those numbers, 10, I think I tried to give you 10 numbers that when you add them up, it comes to 50. Mm -hmm. So I am rewarding the dog on average every five seconds for a sit stay. So it was after those number of seconds. Well, I think I got that wrong. Yeah, I did. Um, you'll have to replay and tell me what the total was. But um, we can't do that and train a dog at the same time. So why are we even talking about these schedules? Of all of the, you know, major schedules, continuous, fixed interval, fixed ratio, um, which we would never use to train a puppy because the reward response is predictable, which means you get scalloping and behavior. As you approach a reward, the, the animal behaves better and better, quicker, faster, more stylish. But as soon as you reward it, the quality drops off the work ethic drops off. So frequency and quality go down the tubes. The variable schedules we can't compute. Um, you know, random reinforcement, inconsistent reinforcement is just as good as all of those, but none of them are any good for training puppies. Why? Because they do nothing to change the quality of behavior. You see, it was all about work ethic all this research was always then going into industrial psychology and all this stuff, you know, to, to increase work ethic, to increase the frequency of responses. Yeah, animals are doing it quicker now in peace rate, but the quality goes down the tubes because they're rushing, you know, you, you get it. Um, and so all of those schedules reward just as many below median quality responses as above medium quality responses, which is insane. Training is about improving behavior in terms of duration, speed, frequency, and quality. Finesse, precision, pizzazz, panache, that sort of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So the dog looks hot, lickety good. So we can go off in a park and show off. Sit. Good dog. Heel. Boom, 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 boom. And the dog's looking up at us like, you know, let's show off. And, um, and this whole learning theory thing took over dog training like a creed. It became creedal. That learning theory books became like Mao's Little Red Book or like religious texts. And people worshipped them and argued about them. And discussions and arguments about learning theory were often happening in lieu of actually training the dog. Yeah. So when I presented learning theory, I said, I call it, here's your basic training sequence. This takes into account lots of principles in learning theory. It combines classical conditioning, associative learning with operant conditioning, changing the frequency of behaviors. It combines it in one four step basic training sequence. Request, lure, response, reward. That's pretty much all you need to know to train this dog up. And, um, but then the, the, the learning theory, and when clicker training came on, it just became a religion. There's no question about it. They now had the two little books. They had the clicker 
and they had the little red book of learning theory. And it, it really did make training overcomplicated, you know, uh, and in a lot of classes, trainers were lecturing to people about theory rather than showing them. It's a fascinating way to train. I mean, I grew up with it, you know, and, and in terms of dogs, I, I was the first person to help promote the very first workshop of uh, clickers used to train dogs that Karen Pryor gave with Gary Wilkes doing the training and, and Karen talking as he, he did it. It's a great training technique, but it's not the only one trick pony training technique for pet owners. It's so slow. It has one of the highest skill sets there is, you know, um, <laughs> To operate a clicker, we're almost up there with the skill set required to operate a shock collar. And it's so difficult uh, for owners to learn, you know, the theory behind it and, and to have the native skills of 100% consistent observation and feedback and the immediacy of feedback, consistency and timing. And so we have to come out with dog training techniques for people who are inconsistent and have lousy timing. So that's what I did, uh, you know, of all the reward training techniques we have. And I would use all five and say, what are the pros and cons of each? And then work out which are the top three in which order you're going to use with any dog. And for me, it's almost always the same. Number one, lure reward training. Number two, if the dog's blowing off the lure because he's been bribed. So for adolescent dogs out of control and over the top, all in unreward training. And then shaping for doing unusual stuff like behaviors not in the dog's normal repertoire, like say doing oh, pirouettes on his front paws. You've got to shape it. You, you can't lure it because the dog never does it, you know, um, or for getting real precision. You know, I find shaping very good for that. So if you're in competitive obedience or you have a, um, a working Malinois and you want him to take one hold and never to adjust, mm -hmm. you don't want him readjusting because then the decoy can rip his hand away and run off and you've suddenly got very few points left, you've failed the trial. Yeah, and so right. for shaping and, and refining behaviors, it's useful. But it's number three on my list of training methods we're gonna use. Instead, we're gonna take a dog, and here's what we're gonna do. The first four trials I do with every dog I meet, okay? I say, hey pup, my name's Ian, here's a treat. Now that is a high-powered temperament test. Does the dog take the treat or not? If yes, we're off and running. We go to trial two. If not, I say, oh, he doesn't like the treat. I give it to the owner. I say, give him the treat. If he doesn't take it from the owner, then I assume he's upset by being here in this strange place or in this class with all these other yeah. dog people. But what if he won't take it from me, but he takes it from the owner? Yeah, yeah. he's upset about me. So now the training set, forget trial two, it's now gonna be classical conditioning to teach you to love me. I'm gonna give this dog 150 treats in about 25 minutes. Therefore they aren't commercial treats, it's just plain old kibble that's broken into eight pieces like Zeewee Peak or Kiwi Kitchen or Jiminy's, you know, easy to break each piece of kibble into eight pieces, but you can get 150 treats. So when you leave, you're gonna look back on me, Grandpa, Grandpa Ian, I love it. Gran and Gramps training school, Gran and Gramps treat dispensary, you know, but if I'm teaching manners, hello puppy, my name's Ian, here's a treat, one step backwards, puppy come, treat, trial three, one step backwards, puppy come, puppy sit, treat, one step backwards, puppy come, sit, down, sit, stand, down, stand. That's four trials, four treats, ten behaviors. By trial four, I'm already up to seven behaviors, come sit down, sit, stand down, stand, for one food reward. There's a ratio of seven to one, okay? I then do trial four, four more times. So now we're up to trial nine. I step back, say, puppy, come here. <laughs> puppy, sit, <laughs> with an empty hand. Bingo. 80% of puppies will do it. By trial nine, I phased out food as a lure, no food in my hand. Mm 
and now back up and do it again. The food comes out of the pocket with my other hand as a food reward. But I've already started even facing it out as a reward. It's so simple. And in one session, before you know it, if you have a breed like a border collie, he's already got it. You've got verbal commands on seven different behaviors in one session. Come, you've got two sits, because they're a bit different. Sit from a stand is very different from sit up from a down. And down from a sit is much easier than down from the stand. And you've got two stands, one from the sit, one from the down. Okay, seven behaviors under verbal control in one session with a quick learner like a border collie. Mm -hmm. You know, for most dogs, it's gonna take about 20, 30 trials before they get it, you know. And now we've got rid of that bogeyman, the food. Because the biggest problem in training after making it too complicated is we're using too much food. And so we're ending, and when we do that, you see, you're progressively devaluing the food. Because the dog's getting so much of it. He's on a very rich schedule. Some of the schedules are continuous still. It's, it's, it's madness. It's crazy. A piece of what kill would you... Sorry. And what would you suggest that people do to keep the dog interested and motivated while sp spacing out the food? Like clapping their hands, being happy? No, just spacing it out does it. By, by making it into a gold medal or a bronze medal or a silver yeah. model, you increase the value of a piece of kibble. But, oh yeah, we can praise, give the kibble and then do a jolly routine. Or we could praise, give the kibble and throw a tennis ball. We could praise, give the kibble and play tug. Or the best one that all dogs love, uh, play, praise, kibble and chase the dog, you know? And so then what will happen is the kibble becomes a secondary reinforcer because it's always followed by these good activities, mm -hmm. all right? Well, the praise will become a tertiary reinforcer that signals the secondary reinforcer. It's not just a secondary, it's a mega secondary reinforcer. It's not just click and treat. You know, click a neutral stimulus followed by a treat. Then click comes to represent the treat, that the treat to predict the treat is coming. Now praise predicts, wow, then I'm gonna get the kibble, which is the secondary enforcer that means that's the next step to, who knows, couch time, tummy rubs, getting to sniff another dog's butt. So it's basically sit, good dog, bit of kibble, say hello, or sniff anus, except they don't say that in public, get it? So, but the point is, if we just phased out um, the food lure, so it's in our pocket as a food reward, now we concentrate on phasing out the food reward and making it meaningful. 